it. So hello and welcome to Alexandria Library. Um, my name is Lily Fedorinova and I'm the undergraduate experience librarian here at Rutgers University Library. And we're really delighted to host this talk today, this afternoon, um, with the, in partnership with the Office of Summer and Winter Sessions. Great. So today we'll hear from John Bader. Uh, Dr. Bader is the executive director of the Fulbright Association and previously served John Hopkins University for over a decade as a Dean of Academic Advising and of Undergraduate Academic Affairs. He's the author of um, Taking the Initiative, Leadership Agendas in Congress and the Contract with America. The topic of today's talk is the second edition of his latest book, uh, Dean's List, which the National Academic Advising Association notes should be recommended um, to any person who is facing college for the first time or anyone who is working with a first, first year student. So before John starts with his talk, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping things. Number one, if you can please silence your cell phone and devices at this time, just so that we limit the, um, the interruptions. I did that earlier too, I had to remember. Um, there's going to be a brief Q&A following the presentation, and we really hope that you engage with asking you know, interesting questions um, of John. But please hold your questions until the end of the presentation, just so that we sort of get through. And then uh, this event is also being recorded by, by RUTV for their At the Podium series and will be broadcast uh, and made publicly available on the internet. So just so you know, if you decide to make a comment, you might show up on the internet. Um, we also want to extend our gratitude to Liz Beasley. Is Liz in here or she's outside? Um, Jen Charnecki and Kristen Michaels um, from the Office of Summer and Winter Sessions for co-sponsoring um, this event and also for providing free copies of the book to all of you in this room. Um, in addition, there's the Barnes & Noble Bookstore, uh, which is also uh, in, you know, right outside, sell, which is available to sell copies of the book. And last thing, if you guys enjoy this presentation and you want to see more events like this, please like the... Um, and follow the Rutgers Libraries and RU Summer and Winter sessions on social media so you can hear and know about these events. So now please join me in welcoming Dr. Bader. Hi everybody, I, uh, I, can you hear me okay? Great, okay, um, So I am very delighted to be here at Rutgers campus. Uh, I'm particularly happy to return to New Jersey. My family has a long history with uh, state of New Jersey. My mother was uh, born in Montclair and she spent much of her childhood in northern New Jersey. My father um, comes from what uh, I guess you could call the first family of Atlantic City. Um, the Bader family uh, was the, the uh, political family of Atlantic City in the 1920s and 30s. So if you've ever seen uh, what's the uh, Boardwalk Empire, um, that uh, features my great-grandfather, who was the mayor of Atlantic City, as was his brother Daniel. Um, I uh, spent uh, some of my childhood in New Jersey, um, and I also returned a couple of years ago to work for John Corzine, uh, who was your senator and governor. I helped him run uh, his first uh, successful uh, Senate campaign. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to be here back in New Jersey, which is, uh, which is home for us. I'm especially pleased to talk to you about uh, the second edition of my book on college success. Um, and uh, as, uh, as just been suggested, there'll be questions afterwards, but uh, I, I would like you to sort of think about what those questions might be so that when we get there, you're not sort of, oh my God, now he's asking if we have any questions, so that don't, be, don't be surprised. Um, uh, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, the, the history of the project so that, you know, books don't just sort of come out of nowhere. They're, they're born from experience and need. And um, for, for me, uh, I had been trained as a, an academic. I have a PhD in political science from the University of Wisconsin. Um, and I began my uh, life as an academic running a small program for UCLA in Washington, D.C., where I uh, Grew up. Anyway, 
Uh, the program was quite small, only about 30 students at any given time. And uh, as a faculty member, a young faculty member, it was very exciting to get to know students. So this was a, uh, this was a, uh, a residential um, internship program, uh, and we had a lot of time together. And I started having really great conversations with undergrads. Uh, trying to understand their lives and what they were worried about and what they wanted to do next. And uh, all of these conversations became very natural as part of this program. And uh, that began my thinking about, well, why, why are, uh, why do we go to college? Why, what's the point of all of this? Uh, and how, when we think about success, how do we, how do we think about that? What does that, what does that even mean? My, then I had the Corzine job, and then I came back to the academy to work for Johns Hopkins University, where I was for 10 years, uh, working every day with undergraduates. Um, uh, if, who in this room is an undergraduate right now? Anybody here? Um, so who am, what am I looking at? The young people in the room, are you going to be undergrads or not? Like, tell me, where, where, where are you in your studies? I'm, I'll be a junior next year, in the fall. You'll be a junior in the fall, but uh, right, a college junior. Yeah. What we're talking about. Yep. Okay. Now, is that about right? Is that where everybody is? We're going to be a senior next year. You're going to be a senior. Okay. Great. Great. All right. So we're kind of running out of time to tell you how to succeed in college. But uh, uh, I began the, that work with uh, juniors and seniors, talking about life after college, and, and in fact, uh, we'll, we'll get to that as part of this presentation. Anyway, so uh, uh, in those years at Hopkins, uh, all of these issues came to the fore as I learned more about uh, undergraduate life and uh, why people fail, which is a very important part of this, this book. Uh, also, uh, as I uh, made more friends in the advising world, I, I gathered uh, wisdom from a variety of other institutions and this particular book features essays from colleagues uh, all, over, all over the country. The reason why there's a second edition is that about a year ago, um, I got a, an email from Hopkins Press, and they said, uh, we're doing a, another printing. We've run out of copies. We want to do another printing. And I said, well, could I just update my bio? It's kind of, it's kind of out of date. And uh, they said, well, We'd rather you didn't do that because it's just another printing. And I said, well, this is, this is kind of silly. Why don't we just, anyway, that, that sort of snowballed. And before I knew it, I was proposing to do another edition altogether. Um, and that gave me the opportunity to, to rethink some of the messaging within the book, in, in particular in two, two ways. One was the message that I have to parents. So the, the chapter on parenting uh, is quite a bit different than it was in the first edition. I was very judgmental with parents that I was working with at Hopkins. I thought that they were much too interfering and a big pain. Uh, and I felt that they should really just go away and leave undergrads alone. Um, and there's some wisdom to that, I'll grant you that, but uh, it's much more complicated than that. Um, and I know that now particularly because my own older son is a, you know, just finished his freshman year of college. And it's, and it's actually pretty, pretty funny that uh, in, my, in my inbox, in today's inbox, is, the, um, is a request for me to pay his tuition. So um, I find that uh, uh, funny and alarming at the same time. Uh, the second is that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of students are coming to college for the very first time. Uh, and this is true for both first generation students who are, um, who are Americans, but also a huge number of folks who are coming from overseas. And a lot of the work that I've done since I left Johns Hopkins has been in international recruitment, international exchange. As was mentioned, I work for the Fulbright Association, I'm a Fulbright scholar myself, and international exchange is an important part of academic life. So the new book is an attempt to, to uh, address those issues a little bit better. And then finally, um, uh, I talked to Hopkins Press about doing 
a companion guide for parents. So, in fact, I've just finished writing that, and uh, that will be coming out uh, shortly. So this, this, this whole project is uh, snowballed from just updating my bio. So uh, um, that, that's somehow life, life sometimes works out. So why write such a book? Why, um, why even talk about this? And that is primarily to address this particular or specific challenge, which is the, the uh, moving from high school to college. That particular transition is one of the most fundamental in American uh, educational system and one of the most difficult. Uh, so we have a problem nationwide, it's probably a challenge right here at Rutgers, uh, that a lot of freshmen fit and they disappear and they never go to college again. Uh, that dropout rate for, for many universities across this country is extraordinary. It can be up to half. Uh, that, um, by the time sophomore year rolls around, uh, almost everybody is gone. And it's, it's, it's alarming and disturbing, particularly for those people, their families who have invested in an education and it's just not working for them. That's one issue. The other is that, for the most part, uh, undergraduates just don't put a lot of thought into what's going on when they make the transition from high school to college. And, uh, so this book is, is designed to help folks think about that. Some of the challenges that incoming freshmen face, I'm sure are familiar to a lot of you. First point I make is uh, uh, the, the teaching environment takes a significant shift. There are teachers in high school and there are professors in college. And those are two very different beasts. A professor really sees him or herself as a partner in learning, somebody who facilitates your learning but is not responsible for it. A freshman in college is responsible for their own education. And that ownership is crucial and mostly misunderstood by students. They, in fact, they keep, when I was at Hopkins, they keep talking about their professors as teachers. I went to see my teacher the other day and she told me that I needed to do this or that and the other. I said, they're not your teacher, okay? You, in fact, are your own teacher. You need to take ownership of this. And that's a shift that uh, a lot of freshmen don't get. There's anonymity. So I was just told there's something like 42,000 undergrads in, at Rutgers. That's a lot of people. That's a, that's a truckload of folks, okay? Whereas um, your high school may have had, what? 400, 500 people in your class? I don't know, you tell me. How many How many were in your graduating class? Well, I was in Michigan, so it was about 500. 500, okay. So you go from a class of 500 to a class of 10,000, okay? That's uh, that's a pretty big jump. For, uh, for some people come from even smaller colleges and then go to even larger universities like Ohio State. It's, uh, it's staggering. And that kind of anonymity is very alarming for incoming first years or freshmen. <coughs> uh, there's lots of time. So the fact is that when you're in high school, you spend most of your time, or a lot of your time, in class, right? You go to, get on a bus, go to school, you're there till two or three in the afternoon, and you go home, etc. cetera. Now, the point being that the learning environment is very structured uh, and teachers, are there to teach, uh, and you're being supervised all the time. In college, you're not. So you might go to a large lecture, but there might be hours before the next meeting, and you're swimming in time. And a lot of first-year students uh, really struggle with that shift. There are no parents around. So uh, now this is a, an American and a British experience, not so much uh, a European or, or other countries where students tend to live still with their parents. In the United States, they come from somewhere else and they live on campus. Um, but that, because parents aren't around, that kind of supervision is, is gone. Uh, and that transition is, uh, is very problematic. There are too many choices. So I'm imagining that, uh, that if you were to publish it, the courses offered here at Rutgers would go on for 
hundreds of pages. I mean, there are probably thousands of courses being offered at any given time, which is amazing and exciting and an important uh, asset to your life. But it's also overwhelming. How do you possibly make all of those choices? When you were in high school, you know, maybe there were two or three classes that you could sort of choose from, but for the, uh, for the most part, it was pretty straightforward what you take. And finally, college is a big place. It's just filled with all kinds of people you'll never meet. You have no idea what they're doing. What, what is going on on this, this campus? It's a, all of these challenges are significant for an incoming freshman. Before we go to um, the 10 strategies, um, I thought I would touch on, as I do in the introductory chapter, some of the cross-cutting themes that you'll find throughout the book. These are things that you'll hear over and over again if you take the time to read it. Um, by the way, the book is dedicated to my sons, and my older son, as I mentioned, is a freshman, or just finished his freshman year, and he still hasn't finished the book. So um, it, it's very annoying to me. Um, you know, I write the book for the guy, and he doesn't even read it. Um, Nevertheless, uh, that's why this presentation will cover much of the book, thinking that you're probably going to read like three or four chapters and then, and then fade away. Um, finding the fit. It is very important, a central theme to this book and to advising across this country, that success is dependent on fit. Whether you have chosen the right institution and you fit here at Rutgers, is crucial to your success, just like the academic choices that you make need to fit who you are and the interests that you have. If you choose things that you're not interested in, you're not going to study them. You're going to treat them with resentment and anger, and you're just not going to get the job done. If you pick it because you love it, you're going to do the work. Friends and family are very important to success at the college level. Even though they may not be here, you're not as going to succeed if your family and your parents are not uh, standing behind you and helping you in a very comprehensive way to think about uh, your life and your uh, a positive attitude. So friends and family are crucial to success. It's not just whether you're academically prepared. It's whether you have built-in relationships that will help you along the way. Self-awareness. It is important but challenging for young, a late adolescent, 17, 18, 19 years old, to be able to perceive what is going on inside themselves. And it is a challenge. But it is my experience, having advised thousands of students, that if they don't take a moment to think about how they feel, and take stock of who they are, they're not going to succeed. Um, I believe very strongly that we have really screwed up the educational system in thinking about how you measure success. I'll talk about this more as we go along. A lot of the way that we think about success is measured externally. So you write a paper, I grade it, and I tell you what I think. I give you a grade, and that's how we measure success. Okay? In other words, have you pleased me? Have you impressed me? Is this paper meeting my standards? Not your standards, mine, because I'm a professor and you're not. The problem with this is that it undermines all of the internal workings that we have for motivation. Why, why, why do I do anything? Well, I, apparently I'm doing a lot of things academically to please a professor, when in fact you should be thinking more internally. When you were writing that paper, was it interesting? Was it worthwhile? Did it fulfill the questions that you had about this particular topic? That you please me is fine, but really this is your education, so why are we so focused on what faculty think? Body and mind are inseparable. I worked for this decade at Hopkins and for the six years before that at UCLA very closely with uh, my friends and colleagues in student affairs. And one of the great strengths of American higher education 
is that we worry about other things. We worry about physical health. We worry about mental health. We concern ourselves with nutrition and with physical exercise and all the things that go into making that kind of connection, the healthy mind-body connection. That's something that Americans do better than anybody else on this planet. I, I can tell you that with great uh, confidence and certainty. But it also means that if you don't pay attention to those things, you're also going to fail. Every plan is worth questioning. So a lot of the students that I've coached uh, over, over many years, they come to college with a plan. Okay, so I'm going to major in biology and become a pre-med, and then I'm going to go to medical school, and that's my plan. Okay, well, why is that your plan? And how, to, how will that work? And are you gonna be happy with that? And what's going wrong with this plan? And who told you this should be your plan? Now, when I was, when I was younger, when I asked these questions, students would think I was being hostile. I'm like, no, no, I, I, I'm not trying to be mean or anything. I'm just trying to ask you whether you've thought about why you have embraced this particular plan. Does this plan belong to you or, say, your parents? Every plan is worth question. A couple more cross-cutting themes for this book. Serendipity. The power of surprise, the power of things that happen unintentionally. Um, I, uh, just three days ago, if you can believe it, I was in Italy. It's a place I love. It's fantastic. Okay? And we, uh, this is Sunday, right? So today is, what, Friday? Thursday. Okay, I've completely lost track. On Sunday morning, we woke up. It was our last day in Italy with my wife and two kids. And we say, you know, really, we'd like to get on a plane today. I mean, we're just fried. We've been here for 10 days or whatever it was. And we said, well, we can't do that because tickets are for tomorrow. All right, so what are we going to do today? Well, why don't we go into this town? We haven't been there yet. We got on a boat, on a bus, and we went into this town. I right? didn't know anything about this town. Okay? And this is where ser serendipity came into play. We got there at 11.30, and all these people in this town were gathering in this square. And we couldn't figure out why they were doing this. And my son, who speaks Italian, asked, was, what, what's going on? And they said, we're here for the shooting. The shooting? <laughs> well, what, what is that about? And, he, and then he said, you know, the word for shooting and the word for parade are actually not that far apart. So maybe I've just misunderstood. And there's a parade. As it turns out, it, it not, wasn't quite a shooting, but it was a lot of explosions. And so at noon, Right along this waterfront, they set off all these incredible fireworks that were basically fired to this explosion. Now, why am I telling you a story? I'm telling you a story because it was serendipity that we were there at all, and that we learned about this strange tradition that they've had in Rapallo for over 500 years. To celebrate the Virgin Mary, they blow things up, which is... When I talked to somebody about this, does that make any sense, blowing things up to celebrate the Virgin Mary? They said, I, I don't know. But that's what we do. So there are moments like that where just something incredible happens, and you won't know that unless you're open to serendipity. Uh, skills, not expertise. Undergraduates in the United States think they are studying to become experts at something, and they are not. Okay? That is not what American higher education is about. That's different in other countries, but here we're not trying to teach you to be biologists, say. And in fact, it doesn't really matter what we tell you about biology. We're teaching you how to think about biology and how to gain the skills to make sense of the world. And so this will be important when we talk about majors in a few minutes. A lot of young people think that studying is about memorizing. That if I could just open up this book and remember everything I'm reading, I will succeed. Wouldn't that be great? I have photographic memory and I can 
understand everything. But the difference between understanding and memorizing are two different things. And uh, American professors ask for much higher levels of thinking and analysis than simple memorization. So that's just, it's just not that simple, but a lot of incoming freshmen think that would be the case. Now, in a little while, we'll be talking about failure. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm proud of this book is because I try to start a conversation, particularly between parents and their children, about failure. Um, it seems weird, but I've read a lot of books about college success. You would think I would do that. And almost none of them talk about what happens if you don't succeed, right? So the, the reverse of success is failure. What does that mean? How, 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 how do you cope with that? What, what, what's happening? Is there something wrong with me? So even in a, in a prestigious place like Johns Hopkins, hundreds of students fail out. I mean, think about that for a second. So this, is a, this university is almost impossible to get into. People have grades and test scores off the scale, and yet they still blow it when they get there. Here at Rutgers, also competitive. I bet you there are thousands of students who are getting D's and F's. I, I, I bet money on it. And, and yet we don't ever talk about that. It's not, it's not healthy. And finally, uncertainty and freedom. So uh, one of the great things about going to college in the United States is that you can choose to do anything. But there's no actual contract, for the most part, for what you do when you show up for study. And that's kind of scary. So a lot of undergrads uh, kind of freak out about this. <laughs> uh, and so they start retreating to things that are really familiar, like uh, subject matter they've heard about before. It's one of the reasons why political science is so um, popular. Well, everybody's heard about politics, so that must be worthwhile. No one's heard about sociology, so why do that? That seems too weird. Uncertainty and freedom are tied together. Okay, so um, I, I do want to give plenty of time for, for conversation and discussion, um, but uh, I'm gonna march us through these 10 strategies, and then we can have uh, what I hope is a, a good series of questions and, and, and points. You don't have to ask a question, you can just make a statement and then we'll go from there. Um, you got to start a book on success by talking about what do you mean by success. Now, there's a certain irony for a book called The Dean's List to then question the value of the grading system, right? Because you make the dean's list typically by getting, say, a 3-5 average or better, right? And, uh, and yet, I spend a, a reasonable amount of time saying that grades are kind of dumb. I mean, the grading system is very externally focused, as I mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier, when in fact, your learning is what matters. So over time, who, who cares if you got a B or an A on anything, really? Honestly, it's just completely unimportant. What matters is what you learn from that experience and what you remember and take forward into your life. But transcript is, is just a bunch of letters. It's not a meaningful summary of your learning experience. It's just about external validation. So the point is not to get a bunch of good grades. The point is to learn. And when you learn and you embrace that particular experience, you get good grades. It's just a sort of side benefit to um, a learning experience that's much more meaningful for your life. In fact, what we're looking for then is fulfillment. So when you learn, you're satisfying curiosity, which I hope you have just naturally developed over your life. So, why is something the way it is? Why do people act the way they do? Why, how does a particular natural phenomenon happen? 
Well, that, those are all questions, and when you answer those questions, you feel fulfilled. And you feel empowered to find out the answers to other questions, and then you go off and learn more, and your whole life can then be driven by questions like, why do they explode things in order to honor the Virgin Mary? Okay, it's like, what the heck is going on with that? That is a question, okay, and worth, uh, worth pursuing. I've already given my problem with grades thing, so I won't repeat myself. One of the points that I make in this particular strategy is the principle of being learned. So in this case, to be learned is effectively to be someone who is educated. And by that, that means somebody who has a, a wide appreciation for the world around him or herself and the tools to make sense of the rest of it. That's what it means to be learned. And I'm trying to make the argument again and again that it is better to be learned than it is to have a great looking transcript. Of course, the two are connected. I'm not suggesting they are. But if you're trying to measure your own success and think about the success of others, you want to say to yourself, well, what are you trying to get out of this? In this case, being learned is what American colleges do best. That is the principle behind a liberal education. So uh, if you want to take fullest advantage of an experience like you would have here at Rutgers, you have to say, okay, what is it that they're trying to do for me? What am I paying for? What am I working on? I'm, work I'm, I'm working on being learned. That's what I'm working on. This um, strategy, too, is about the relationship that students have with parents. And as I, as I mentioned now that I'm the father of a college student, that's really interesting to me um, because when when my son first went to college, I completely freaked out. <laughs> I, I really did. Like, where, where are you going? What's happening? I've, I've completely lost. And, and here I am. I'm supposed to be this national expert on this transition, and I'm completely falling apart. I, 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 I found myself um, wondering what, what, what I was supposed to do. So this parent's guide that's coming out, that will be more from the parent's point of view as to how, how we handle students. But in this particular case, I worried a lot about the degree to which today's parents and the millennials that are in school uh, communicate with each other and collaborate with each other and make decisions together all the time. And I reflect, of course, back on my own experience. Um, I was a freshman, if you can believe it, almost 35 years ago. Um, and I don't remember my parents ever even talking to me about what I was taking. And yet today's students spend a lot of time collaborating with, the, with their parents about what they're supposed to take and when they're supposed to take it and what they're going to major in. And this whole thing is a kind of collective decision making that I found very unfamiliar. And many of my colleagues in the faculty and advising and elsewhere also had the same issue. Big, big challenge. Finding a way to be a little more independent of that dynamic is what strategy two is about. And I offer a couple of ways of thinking about that. The first is to think about imagining a new relationship. So all of us have relationships of various kinds. And you think to yourself, well, how do I grow or change that relationship? Well, one of the ways that you do that is to imagine what it would look like in a better way. So if you're thinking of yourself as wanting to be more independent of your parents in making decisions about academic choices, you first have to start by thinking, well, what would that look like? Be less needy. Okay? Well, one of the reasons why parents get so involved is because students express need for their validation and advice and feedback and approval, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Now, some of this is perfectly natural. Uh, you're, uh, one of the main jobs that parents have is to strengthen their children emotionally, giving them support, 
and helping them feel better about the world. That's a, that's a big, important job for parents. But um, as you grow older, you've got to start sort of weaning yourself from that dependence. But that's not going to happen if you're, you don't work on being less needy. Okay? So for example, and I'll come back to this uh, a little bit later, uh, what am I going to do when I grow up? It's a good question, right? I want to think about what to do next. Well, if you don't do some thinking about that on your own, if you don't get the help you, that you may need to think about the future of your career, etc., well, your parents are going to fill that vacuum. So if you want to be less needy, do some thinking about that. Don't just let somebody else do the thinking for you. Take some ownership. Be less needy. And finally, uh, be, be proactive. So that's tied to being less needy, but the sense here is that you want to anticipate what you need to do and what to do next. And if you've got a plan of your own making, your parents are going to say, well, okay, All right, we'll go ahead. So uh, uh, a, a quick story on this. So um, a student of mine was really struggling with an engineering uh, curriculum that she was following. She wasn't very good at, uh, at higher level math. She was struggling with physics. Things were not going well, okay? Uh, yet her parents expected her to major in, I think it was mechanical engineering at Hopkins, and this is what she was supposed to do, okay? This, this is why you're here, mechanical engineering. We sent you to all those damn robotic camps, you know? It's time for you to pay, it's time for you to be an engineer. And she was concluding that that was not a particularly good thing for her. I said, we're okay. But you have got to be proactive about an alternative to this. If, if you just fail out of the engineering program and just sit there like a lump, like some kind of victim, your parents are going to get very upset with you. Understandably, because you're just, you're just falling apart. But if you have another plan, if you have something else you're going to substitute with, now, it, it might be hard for your dad, say, to accept the fact you're not going to be a mechanical engineer. But if you can then say, well, actually, I'm working on this other thing, and I have a plan for getting an internship, and I've gotten some career counseling, and all this is, you know, all right, so he's going to be a little bit upset, but at least he's going to be reassured that something good will happen, and you'll be okay. Because that, of course, is the main reason why parents are interfering, because we don't trust you enough to say you're going to be okay. If you're proactive, you can disarm them on that front. Strategy three, understand where you are. So a lot of undergrads wander around these campuses that have no idea who's doing what, okay? So what, who are all these grown-ups? What, what the heck are they doing here? Um, now, a lot of undergrads are completely oblivious to this, and they think, who cares? Well, it does matter because if you don't know, for example, what faculty do, you will not understand how to fit into the academic environment and take fullest advantage of it. Faculty have a lot going on. And this is something that most undergrads are just, just don't tune into. Now, if you're a faculty member here at Rutgers, you are definitely working on trying to get, secure, or maintain tenure, okay? This is how uh, American higher ed works. And how do you get tenure? How do you get tenure? Publish. Publish, okay? That's it, okay? The rest is all nonsense. You need to publish cutting edge research in your field or your toast. All right, so what does that mean for you as an undergrad? What that means is that, they're, first of all, they're not your teachers, okay? They got other things going on. They are primarily researchers, okay? And then you've got to think, okay, well, if, if I'm trying to learn from a researcher as opposed to a teacher, what, what do I do? Well, first of all, you have to respect what else they're doing. And you have to think about how to plug into that world. So the world of engagement, discovery, that's what you got to do. You're not going to sort of sit around and let 
learning fall from the sky. You've got to go and join in. Right? You also got to know that they have other things on their minds. So a typical scene is if an undergrad has enough courage to go into office hours. Right? Now I'm imagining that those of you who are still in school, have you ever gone to office hours? Raise your hand if you've gone to office hours. See, almost nobody goes to office hours. Maybe, okay? The point is it's kind of intimidating, right? You go in there, oh my God, you know, I don't know who this person is. Well, that's right, and they don't know who you are. So you show up, you're in some, some big psychology class, and you show up and you don't know what to do or say. Well, the faculty member's gonna go like, and they're thinking, I gotta say this. Like, what are you doing here? I mean, I, I got things to do, and you don't have, you're not even prepared in coming to my office hours to ask me any questions. So there's this awkward silence, and it goes very poorly, and then the undergrad finally leaves, and the whole thing has just been ugly. And that's because, to be frank, the undergrad didn't know what was going on, which is that that, re that guy is a researcher, and you need to come with good questions in mind. Understand the system. There are other players on a the campus. There's uh, deans and presidents and all kinds of other characters. Uh, and it's good to know who they are in order to know who could support you. I won't go into that in any more detail. Strategy four. Understand that the curriculum is a great feast. So it's very important when we talk about the theme of fit to success that you figure out how to go explore what's available to you to find the right fit. And that's why sampling is so crucial. There are lots of ways of doing this. Of course, you can take a year or two just sampling randomly, but you could also talk to people. You could go to office hours. You could go to the bookstore. Uh, you could read more online. You could go to the sociology website and find out what the heck sociology is. There are ways of sampling to help you find the right fit for success. There are some questions that you want to ask yourself as you approach all of the choices in front of you, and these four questions are among those. What do I think the most important is the first one. What do I want to know? So you really have to say to yourself, okay, I am here to learn. I am the owner of my education. What do I want to get out of this thing? What do I, in other words, what do I want to learn? Other questions are just as valid, but uh, this one is, that one's very, very important. What is required? Now, in order to graduate from Rutgers, you've got to do what you've got to do, okay? And you need to know what that is, but you shouldn't let that drive the whole bus because universities like Rutgers structure their curriculum in a way as to effectively force you to go and sample. Now, if you were going to Oxford or Edinburgh, they wouldn't do that. You would come in as a philosophy student, and that's all you'd study, philosophy, end of story. If you were a physicist, physics student. That's all you would do. You wouldn't go take courses in poetry and Japanese art. I'm not going to do that. That's not how it works. Here you do that. And sometimes that's a matter of uh, meeting requirements. What skills do I need? Right. So we talked about how you're not really gaining expertise, you're gaining skills. All right. So which skills? And what do you want to know how to do? Then you take courses in order, so if you are thinking that uh, I need to be able to do some kind of high level mathematical analysis of economic data, right? Okay, that's a good skill to have. Who teaches you that? There are accounting classes, there are uh, econometric classes that do that, statistics, uh, a variety of different uh, approaches to this. A, a lot of statistics are handled by different Disciplines in different ways. Go take some of them. And where is the surprise? We talked about the power of serendipity, of sort of stumbling into something amazing. As it turns out, that thing might be your calling. And 
if you're not open to the surprise, if you don't try to build that in, you'll never find that. You keep thinking, oh, this is what I'm supposed to study, and you never get around to what you actually love to study. Strategy five. Um, why do we have majors? So everybody, uh, undergrad, this sort of preoccupation, what am I going to major in? Or you're at a party, man, I don't know, maybe I've been to an undergrad party in 30 years, so what do I know? Uh, people used to say, so what you, what's your major? As a kind of starting point for a conversation. Oh, I'm studying this and that. It would appear that majors are really important. Right? You can't graduate without a major. So, so why, why do we do this? Well, we do this to sort of compromise on this idea that a liberal education shouldn't just be chaos. It needs to have some kind of core. But beyond that, the rest is all nonsense. In fact, Americans generally have an ambivalent attitude toward expertise. So because we have a long history of fighting the man, right? We have a long history of suspicion toward hierarchy. We have uh, outright hostility toward aristocracy. And the power of knowledge in held in very limited hands is something that makes us very uncomfortable. If you look at the history of American higher ed, you realize that colleges and universities like this one were founded to build society. So, you know, we start this country in, in wilderness, effectively, well, how, how, and without a king. So how do you build a society? Well, you, you need a bunch of people who can do a lot of different things and think for themselves. And that's the reason why this is, higher ed is kind of a mess, because it reflects our culture of um, an ambivalence toward expertise. Majors. Um, are not careers. So you major in something that's not necessarily going to lead to a career. That's just not how it works. So take a small liberal arts college like Dickinson, where my son goes to school, and you probably have 35 majors, give or take. Well, their alumni go on to do hundreds of things, if not thousands of things. And therefore, just by mathematics, your major is not a particularly good predictor of what you're doing. Um, I was a history major. I now, uh, I now lead a, a group of 100,000 American alumni for the Fulbright Association. And that's right. So my training in history helps, but it, it, it didn't lead to this by any means. As you think about majors, you want to think about why, why am I doing this? While well, I'm doing this, I should be, I should have integrity make this choice to reflect who I am and to love the choice that I've made. And that's really, really important. And finally, the value of your education. This is where the payoff problem comes into play, meaning that why am I doing this? The payoff is not a career. It's not, it's not gonna, that's not the payoff. And if you think it is, you're going to be disappointed. The payoff is that you're a learned person. If you keep that in mind, you'll be okay. A couple more and then we'll open up the conversation. I hope you have some questions or some arguments to make uh, when, when that comes up. Strategy six is about study. So uh, a lot of first year students, and those of you who are juniors and seniors probably figured out a lot of this, um, they basically think that they need to absorb everything and memorize everything and then regurgitate that back. But that really is not how it works. So for example, if you take organic chemistry, for some of you, has anybody taken organic chemistry? Okay, yeah. It's it's really a, really hard. Okay? But one of the reasons why it is hard is that people think, well, if I just memorize all the formula, then I'll be fine. But that's not what the professor is asking you to do, they're asking you to solve problems and to think about how these components, these different organic components interact with each other. Okay? It's, not, it's not so simple. 
you have to make strategic choices when you're a, a student then. You can't remember everything, and you're not going to do that. So you have to start asking questions rather than just trying to drink it all in. Case in point, a lecturer. Now, I'm imagining a university of this size has a lot of lectures, right? You spend a lot of time in lectures. Now, these, this is a practice that goes back to the Middle Ages, and you sort of wonder why. Kind of a theoretically kind of idiotic way to learn. If you're, and you're listening to me now, so I'm sort of lecturing to you right this minute, you have to think about what, what is my role when I'm listening to a guy like this guy? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to just remember everything he said? No. The answer to that question is that it's you're part of an internal conversation. You need to be asking questions of yourself as you listen and be much more engaged and less passive than a lecture would suggest. If you can do that, uh, you'll get more out of it. Experimenting with what works, that's pretty straightforward. The last point is titanically important, and that is sleep. So one of the things that I'm most proud of my son is that he knows when to go to bed. Doesn't sound like a major accomplishment, but he manages his time so that he can go to bed at some reasonable moment, around like 11 o'clock, 11.30. His knucklehead friends go to bed at like three or four in the morning. Now, between midnight and three in the morning, these, these students are absorbing nothing. They might look like they're studying, but they are getting nothing out of it. And their adolescent brain really needs that sleep. If you don't get sleep, you're not going to succeed. End of story. Mm -hmm. Chapter. Uh, this chapter is about diversity. The, this past year in higher ed has been a fantastically exciting one, very controversial. Uh, as many um, populations, many um, peoples on various campuses have objected to mainstream culture on campus. Okay? A lot of issues around uh, understanding and respect, and it's, it's fantastic. It's con conflicted and awful in many ways, and there's a lot of pain and suffering that's come from these conversations, but they've been really exciting and worthwhile. And why is that? Because we have to learn from each other. That is the reason why we're here. So one of the reasons why a university constructs a class as they do is not so that everybody does incredibly well academically. Okay? Otherwise, just bring in one kind of person and that's the end of it. No, they want to create a conflicted, complicated environment in which we all don't really understand each other, but we're going to work on figuring that out. The point I'm making with this chapter and this strategy is that you're not really going to get the most out of college until you go ahead and engage in that stuff, however uncomfortable it might be. Diversifying your experience, for example, throwing yourself into situations that are uncomfortable, that's your job, that's why you're here. If you avoid all that, you're, you're not taking advantage. Study abroad, which is uh, obviously very important to, to me in my life, um, is equally important in that sense. You want to disrupt your thinking and bring diversity into your learning life. The next two strategies, and I'll try to tie things up in the next couple minutes, um, are about failure. And I, I've talked about this a bit, but I, I think it's really important that we not sort of put that under the rug. Failing is something all of us do. In, in some way, we fail every day. Um, those of us who are who have lived some period of time, we just accumulate failure. Right? I've had some incredible disasters in my life. Okay, and as you go through your life, you have them. Coping with that, understanding why that's happening, is crucial to success in your life, not just here on a college campus. It's very important, therefore, that we open up those conversations. The four 
uh, main reasons that I identify in the book about why people fail are right in front of you. I'll, I'll, uh, the latter three are, are pretty self-evident. The first one is really important, and it, it all ties into this idea of fit and integrity and curiosity. You're, it's hard work to learn. Okay? There are long hours, there's lots of assignments, there's a lot to do. Okay? And it's very hard to do this if you don't really want to do this. It's so important then that you find things that naturally make you want to do the hard work. Okay? That you are satisfying your natural curiosity and you really want to learn. If you don't have that, there's this cycle of anger and resentment that will snowball and destroy you. Uh, I'm being a bit rhetorical, but I've seen this happen hundreds of times, where if you don't believe in what you're doing, you're toast. And I've, I've you know, some student says, I, I just, when I get up in the morning, I just don't want to do this. I don't want to do this, so I keep putting it off. I don't really want to read this textbook because it's so boring. No. There, might be, there might be a component of depression there. There might be some other things going on. But at, at minimum, this is a student who keeps procrastinating on and on because they don't want to do that. Eventually, the whole thing is just going to blow up in their faces, and that's exactly what happens. Coping with these failures is, of course, equally important. Acknowledge what's going on, do something about it. One of the great strengths of, of a place like Rutgers is the ability to bounce back. Uh, there are all kinds of people behind you to support bouncing back. Uh, oddly enough, the, probably the most important player in all of this is the faculty. They are there, they have succeeded and they are sitting where they are because they love what they do. You need to plug into that. You need to realize that that is a source of strength for any college campus. Finding that motivation can be done by modeling after people like the faculty. It can come from experimentation. It can come from thinking about this odd conversation you just had, some puzzle that just doesn't go away, time abroad. There are lots of ways of sparking uh, curiosity and a sense of wonder that is crucial to academic success. I will I will uh, get help specifically. Let me actually explain what I mean by that. Um, it's very important in the sort of self-awareness of deconstructing your problems to know exactly how, what help you need and where. And it's very important that you don't just sort of, oh my god, I don't know what to do, everything's falling apart. So, all right, what what pieces of this can we pull from this fabric that's unraveling in front of you, and where can we get you help specifically? That could be, and just related to the point above it, deconstructing your time. Now, it could just be that you have no idea how to manage the eight-hour stretch, stretching out in front of you. You can learn that. There are, you know, on most college campuses, there are coaches, there are study consultants, whatever you might call them here, they can show you how to do that, and you need to take advantage of that. Get help specifically, not just in a kind of vague fashion. And that final point about taking care of yourself. Again, Americans think a lot about the whole person. Well, you should too. Um, I have dealt with a lot of students who are fighting depression, schizophrenia, a variety of other mental health problems, a lot of which become manifest at age 18 or 19, um, eating disorders, all kinds of things. And so it's really terrifying. Like this, I was fine just last year. And now here I am, miles from home. Uh, 
my mom and dad are not here. I, the whole world's unraveling in front of me. Yeah, that does happen. It does happen, and you can get help to do that. It's okay. I have a lot of students who, who felt there was so much shame in getting help for those kinds of things that they never got it, and they failed out of college. Um, the last point, and again, we'll open up for questions and comments and whatever you like, um, is about planning for life after college. As I mentioned to you, as I started my advising career, I started with this question. So, where do I go next? Um, and I found there were so many students struggling with the expectations that they had and that their parents had about how this was all going to be able to plan out really easily. Uh, and then when they realized that that's not quite so simple, they got really upset. Uh, well, that's it. I don't know what to do with myself. I guess, I don't know. Or they would turn to something sort of lazy. So as a political scientist, I probably have had more than my share of students who want to go to law school. They come to me and they say, Professor Bader, Dean Bader, whatever. I want to go to law school. Can you write me a letter of rec? And I'll say, uh, why, why do you want to go to law school? Well, you know, I, I uh, law school, uh, you know, what are you? see, then they're, they're not really answering the question. They say, well, you make a lot of money as a lawyer. Say, you make a lot of money if you're a good lawyer. Do you know what it means to be a good lawyer? Well, no, no, but, you know, if I got a law degree, I could do really anything I want. Oh, really? Isn't it possible that you could do anything you want without a law degree? Because after all, law schools teach you how to be a lawyer, not to be anything. Isn't it possible that you're just smart and you could do anything you want to do? And then they get all upset. It's like, wait a minute, I came in here for a letter of rec from law school, and here you are undermining the whole, the whole thinking. Yes, I am. Because I want you to think through that. One of law school is big. Big commitment. Now you're going to get in serious debt, and you are being trained to do something you better want to know how to do. Because if you're going to succeed, you better be a good lawyer, pay off all those debts. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it, this is dark humor. Um, you, you you better know what you do next. So I would always say, look, the difference between an undergrad and graduate school is night and day. It's a completely, it's a totally different thing. When you're planning for getting a master's or PhD or whatever it is you want to do next, you better be clear in your mind why you're going to do that. Like, what does that profession look like? When I got my PhD, I, had, I didn't even think about this. I said, I, I'd be a good academic, I think. And I'm, I know a lot about politics. I grew up in a political family. I worked at ABC News. I worked on a you know 100 campaigns. I, I know about politics. Yeah, but I, I didn't know anything about what tenure meant. I didn't know anything about how research was done. I didn't know any of that stuff. I should have done it, okay? Because as it turns out, I wasn't actually all that happy being a traditional professor. Which is why I wrote this book about advising. It's not a book about political science. Okay? Thinking through these things is very important. And there are ways of doing this. One of the things that drives me crazy about undergrads is they work so hard to figure out where to go to college. And they prepare to go to college, and they did all that work and the analysis and yada yada yada. And then they're so they work, hard. they know how to work hard to make choices. But when it comes to careers, they don't do anything. And your career center, I'm sure, is as lonely a place as it is at Johns Hopkins. Okay? Because nobody goes to career centers. Oh, yeah, I don't know. What do they do? I don't know. Help me put the resume together or something? No. They help you be more disciplined in your thinking about what to do next. All right, I'm, the last thing I'll say, because I'm running quite over time here, and what to do if you don't know what to do. 
Okay, so, oh my God, I have no idea. Right, I've thought through these things and I don't even know what to do next. All right, so I have a couple suggestions. One, don't worry about 30 years from now. Worry about two years from now. So think about, all right, what, what could you do in the short run, which would be interesting and challenging, all right? Second thing is think about what's important to you. Is it important for you to be close to your family? Is it important for you to be in New York City? Is it, what, what's, well, what's important? This is sort of, and, and then just go do that, okay? And don't worry about whatever else is there. Think about the international. So, uh, as you know, I work for the Fulbright Association. The Fulbright is a scholarship uh, that is uh, ready for your application. Uh, I'll give you my card. You can. I, I coached over a hundred winners of the Fulbright myself. If you want to talk to me about it, I'll do that. Um, you have an office right here on campus that can help you win something like Fulbright. Go travel, go do something interesting, go do something strange. Go work for the Peace Corps. Do something in the short run, gives you a little more time, and gives you something really cool to do. I talked way too much, but, um, but I, I hope uh, you'll do some of that too now. Um, questions, comments, reactions, you're crazy, whatever. Um, floor is yours. Yeah, please. Uh, what do you think is the value of doing a pre-college program in order to prepare for college? Do you think it really teaches you or prepares a high school student for it, for the transition? Yeah, I, I think I, a lot of pre-college programs are terrific, um, in part to make it less mysterious. What exactly are you going to be seeing when you're on a college campus? I personally think that it's, it's not a good idea to think of those experiences as a way to boost your academic credentials. Uh, because that should be cooked into all that you've been doing before college anyway. What it can do is introduce you to issues like this, make you feel a little more comfortable, know where you can get help, feel that um, this is a normal thing to do, I'm going to be okay. A lot of college success, as I've tried to point out, is about attitude. Now, if your attitude is one of confidence, curiosity, and optimism, you're probably going to be just fine. And pre-college programs, if they're well done, can give you some of that. And uh, that's, uh, that's a good investment. Can you talk a little more about that? I don't know what it is or where you go for that. So uh, they vary in, in size and length, but typically they're summer courses, often offered by a university. They last anywhere between one week and six. Um, they may have an academic component. You take some courses, um, often for college credit. So when I was at Hopkins, uh, among my responsibilities was running the summer school. And we had a pre-college uh, component to it. Uh, so we offered one and two week classes, we offered six week classes, et cetera. Um, they're, they can be expensive. But by being on a campus, students go, oh, I can do this. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, as I said, I wouldn't load up with that stuff. I wouldn't say to yourself, this is how I'm going to get, become more competitive for college admission. Uh, I, I don't really buy that argument particularly, but I do think it can be a good attitude adjustment. Yeah. Good questions. Other thoughts? Yes, please. I think a, a weak spot when I went to college 100 years ago, <coughs> weak spot was going to your advisor. Almost nobody went. Right. What is the situation today? Do, do students go willingly and as often as they should to get the help they need? Excellent question. Yeah. Um, like, like you, when I was in college, 
Um, they assigned us a faculty advisor. Uh, I went to this guy once. I, on my application, I told him I wanted to major in biology, which I didn't do, in part because the first time I went to visit this guy, he thought the whole undergrad experience was nonsense. He basically said, you should become, as quickly as you can, a graduate student in biology. So I said, well, I thought to myself, so to be kind of like you, and a lot of advisors sort of do things to validate their own choices, which is very ugly. And but this and so I was an undergrad at Yale, and they they had a lousy non-existent advising system. So today, that's a that's a whole other thing. Uh, the fact is they built in academic advising, which has become much more serious as a profession, as a way of thinking, as a, a, as a discipline. A lot of schools require that you get advising each semester. At Hopkins, you could not register for classes without seeing your advisor. The advisor actually clicked a button on the system that allowed you to go register online. Now, how meaningful those conversations are do vary. I won't, uh, I won't dispute that. One of the changes that I made to the advising system at Hopkins was to make all freshman advising by professionals, not by faculty. What that meant was that folks like me, who had an academic background but no skin in the game, could say, well, I don't really care where you go study. I, that's, not, that's not for me to decide. I, I'm your advocate. I want to see you, student, succeed, so I'm going to help you find the best fit, as opposed to representing my department and advocating for whatever it is we do. So it's complicated, but the advising environment has definitely become much richer and uh, much more engaging than, than ever. And so, you know, if you and I were undergrads today, we'd be a lot better off. Of course, you might have the same nightmares I do, thinking, you know, I, where I, I, I'm, I'm registered in a class, and I, I've forgotten to go to class, and that, those are some lingering nightmares that I continue to have, <laughs> even though I've been out of college a long time. Um, other, other questions, comments? Um, that, that can also include what you're saying makes sense or doesn't, uh, as you wish. Yeah, please, Matt. Um, so, first of all, thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Um, um, so, obviously, the target audience for your book is those folks making the transition from high school to college. Um, but are there any particular strategies or advice that you would give to any sort of non-traditional students, adult learners, um, international students? Uh, well, I, I like to think, because I've worked with many different kinds of students, including adult students and, and those who are returning from other adventures, uh, that a lot of these same strategies still apply. So while the conversation is about that transition, the lessons are still the same. For example, uh, an adult learner still has to be very careful and strategic about what choices they make. Uh, and they now chances are that their choices are well informed. Uh, typically, uh, a non-traditional student knows what they need, and that's why they're there. But it's it's these are always plans worth questioning. So even with a stu student who claims to know, oh yeah, I, I really need this particular degree, I'm still going to ask that student, are you sure? Uh, is this a good fit for you? Are you really interested in doing this as opposed to just getting the credential? Because you really have to think about process. And I remember, I remember thinking when I finished all that I needed to do for my doctorate, wow, this is great. But it was a split second. It was just one moment. And then I go on with my life. The five or six years that preceded it was about process. I, I had to want to be in the process in order to get the credential. And a lot of students, even more traditional, non-traditional students, they haven't really, they thought about the credential, but not about the process. 
So I, I would hope these things would apply to those circumstances. Yes, please. Um, so you were talking about how you go from undergrad to grad, and you, asked, you told us that you should question what you're doing, right? So like, what do you suggest we should do to really like figure out what our path will be in the, from undergrad to grad? Like what path we should take? Like what, what strategy should we use for that? So a couple of thoughts for you. First is that um, there's a lot of pressure on undergrads, current undergrads, to be thinking about graduate school. It's something, it's, it's now become a sort of truism that you can't succeed in life without a higher, without a master's or something else. Uh, that's, first of all, that's not true. Okay, that's empirically false. Um, it's also the case that if you jump to that too quickly, you may be taking on obligations that you can't fulfill. Um, if you get a master's in a particular uh, area, your resume is going to say that for the rest of your career. And it will look like that's the path you, you want to go. In. Whereas, in fact, later on you discovered you want to go this way. And now you're saddled with a credential that's actually holding you back because people will say well you're really an expert in this and we want you to be an expert in that and you could say well look in the five years since my master's I've been doing just the thing you want me to be expert in I am an expert in this and they'll go well what's this whole master's thing about are you ambivalent about your career are you indecisive so oddly enough getting Getting credentials can actually be a weight to things that you're doing, not just, not just opening doors. So that calls for some significant thinking. Now, in my opinion, uh, there are at least three things you should do. The first is, if, if you're not ready, don't. Give yourself some time. It, it, it's, most of the time, going straight from college to graduate school is a mistake. It, I mean, now this is just anecdotal. I have no empirical evidence beyond that. But most of the students that I've known have done that have failed out or given up. And it just doesn't work. So give yourself time. Second is talk to a lot of people. So educate yourselves. What, what happens when you get this particular degree? What happens next? Or the reverse. I really love the work you're doing. How did you get there? As it turns out, what I thought I needed to get where he is, is not what I need to do. I need to do something else. Wasn't that surprising? And I didn't know that until I had those conversations. And the final thing is, as I say, the, the career center stuff. Um, uh, a number of years ago, for example, I didn't know what to, I often don't know what to do with myself. It happens every three or four years. <laughs> and, and just complete chaos ensues, okay? By getting career counseling, you can actually structure your thinking. So instead of thinking chaotically, you can, you can measure things. Say, okay, these are the 10 things I need to think about in this order. This is really important to me. This is not so important to me. These are skills I have. These are skills I don't have. These are things that I want to do. This is the kind of people I like to work with, etc. If you can be more systematic about your thinking, you're going to be okay. But just saying, your parents say, you know, you you got to go get a master's and whatever, and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. If your answer to them is that I've had these conversations, I need to take my time, I've been more analytic about it, it will work out. Yes, sir. I'd comment on the difference between a small, global, large colleges and a huge university like Rutgers. And, you know, there, there was a paper written several years ago, I think it was an American scholar, that the small colleges are on our way out. They're going to become branches of, of big universities. I've not seen that happen. Uh, and I pray to God that does not happen. Um, I think, in fact, uh, a huge strength of American higher ed are our small colleges. They were founded to create 
um, civil society. You know, I mean, a, a little college like Lafayette was founded by a group of business people in in that community. Who said, you know, we need to we need to become a big town, Eastern Pennsylvania. How are we going to do that? How are we going to rule ourselves without our own little college? Uh, I am a firm believer in the small, but I think you can get the small everywhere, including in a large university. It's a matter of choice. So if you go to a place like Rutgers and sign on to, what are the, some of the most popular majors? Now, give me an example. Mechanical. Mechanical. Mechanical engineering, okay. Another example, econ maybe. Okay, so you sign on to an econ course or an econ major, you're probably only gonna take lectures and there are probably gonna be four or 500 people in these lectures, maybe more. So there are intro site classes that have like two and three thousand people in it. It's unbelievable. Guess whose fault that is? That's your fault. Okay? You went with the crowd. You decided that you were going to major in econ. That's your choice. You can choose smaller programs. You can choose smaller classes. You just have to make that choice. You can also do things that no one else is doing. So there might be some smaller uh, engineering department. Maybe they do sound engineering. Only six people doing that. Okay, even, it's, even though it's a huge university, they wouldn't have a sound engineering program. I'm making this up, I don't know if you have sound engineering. Um, if it were a small college, right? Because no small college has the resources to have a sound engineering uh, program. They can't hire the faculty, they can't do the labs, blah, blah, blah. A big place like this can do that. So you want to take advantage of the big resources and then go small within them. Same choice with, say, study abroad. Don't follow the whole crowd. Hey, everybody goes to Florence. Stop going to Florence. Okay, about 45 minutes from Florence is Siena, one of the most beautiful places on the planet. And only a handful of students study in Siena. Go there. Yeah. What do you think of taking a year off after high school before beginning college the way a lot of kids do in Europe? Guess who did that? You. So my parents, uh, we lived in Alexandria, Virginia. My parents wanted to move into the district, into, into the city. So I'm not going to go to, I'm not going to change high school in the last year of high school. So I geared up to graduate early from high school, and I did. And then my parents didn't move. Parents are so annoying. Um, so uh, I graduated early, but I, I really was not ready for college. That's why I, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what that's all about. So I spent a year working on Capitol Hill. Sounds cool and sexy, but it was incredibly boring. Um, I did a little bit of traveling. What I think that did for me was to give me perspective on the power and importance of education and really value the whole environment. So my friends who went straight from high school to college, and most of them did that, that was just sort of an obligatory thing. Everybody, that's just sort of, let's follow the crowd. Everybody, everybody goes to college, go to college without thinking about well, why or what, what's the point of this? And unintentionally, uh, I, I realized, wow, this, you know, it's really great to be on a college campus. It really is great. It's so much fun. It's so interesting. It's so provocative. I really miss it. You know, I work for a small nonprofit, and I'm not on a college campus. I really wish I were because I always love these places. They're great. And if you don't value that, you are an idiot. If you take a year off and that helps you appreciate where you are, God bless, do it. But don't you find that the person that takes a year off just never goes back? No. No? No. Um, because I, that, that's a family function. So families that are committed to education 
that, that know that college is a good idea, they're not going to let go of that idea. Uh, they're going, it, it has to be planful, okay? So students that graduate from high school with no plan, I suppose it's possible that they wouldn't go to college. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, they say, I, I just want to take a year off and do something else. And they still go through the application process. They still have their SATs all cooked and ready to go, references, etc. And they have a plan for what to do with that year off. Um, so, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about it. Yeah. Questions back here? No one's gone to sleep, which is really amazing. Really happy about that. Yeah. Can we talk about the path from high school to college, particularly, you know, the pressures of high school students having to take the right classes, having to have the right scores to get to a good college? Like, what would you advise? You know, because there is a lot of pressure and stress for yeah. high school students. Well, this to tie those two together, sometimes that's very, the year off is very healthy because the student has gone through a serious pressure cooker. So the gig I had just before this, I was the chief officer at International Baccalaureate. So IB schools that you'll see all around the world, they are very intense places. Um, and that's not even, that's pretty typical now. Okay, so students take a ton of AP classes or they, again, IB classes, they, they're, they're, they're thinking so competitively, how to get into college, how to get everything right, everything's gonna be perfect. They've got to do all these activities, ace the SAT, whatever. Oh my God. You know, and they're like 16 years old. It's, it's almost cruel. It actually worries me a lot that those of us who are in power abuse those who are not. And high school kids are the victims of way too much pressure, in my opinion. You've got to dial that back. I, you know, it, it drives me crazy. It's one of the things I tried to do at IB was to, to, to dial it down. I, um, I think that a lot of that is caused by parents. I think if parents were a little bit more, a little lighter, a little less concerned, there are so many great places to go to college. You're going to be fine. I mean, we were just talking about small liberal arts colleges. Most small, and there are thousands, literally thousands of these things, okay? Most of them are not all that competitive to get into, and yet they're all terrific. Okay, so you, you set aside the top, say, 50 liberal arts colleges, from 50 to, say, 200, these are amazing places. You're not, if you don't have a perfect transcript or whatever, you're going to get into that place. You're going to be fine. You're going to rock. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> Dial it back, really. Life is too too short to be exhausted all the time. Are there are a lot of books like yours out. I mean, I, I really appreciate the fact that when I read a quote about this, I called him right away or emailed him, and I think it's a much needed. I am, and you probably wonder why I'm the only non-college student here. I have you're more than welcome. Go four tell very me. bright young uh, grandchildren, grandsons, and they live in Florida. They're very bright, and their father passed away eight years ago, and I'm helping them through college. And I want to get a so there's two in college now. They're both small colleges, um, and I want to send them I wanted to get more out of college than I got out of college, where I had to work 40 hours a week when I went to college. That's not so common anymore. But well, I, I, I do appreciate the book, and I want to know, are there other guys like yours out there? None that are worth buying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, of course. Of course, there are lots of good books. There's in like a year and a half, one of my best friends is coming up with a, coming out with a book uh, that will be a direct competition. I, I'm so furious with her. Um, uh, but uh, um, I, 
appreciate that, first of all. Yeah. Um, and obviously one of the reasons why I'm here is, is, to, um, is to do the pitch. I would love to see Rutgers uh, adopt the book as part of their incoming freshman orientation and freshman seminars. That would be, that would be fantastic. I, I think just generally being more thoughtful about what you're doing and why you're doing it. If a book like this provokes that kind of thinking, great. If just a conversation with your parents about like, all right, I'm about to go to college, why am I doing that? Seems like a reasonable question, right? So we're about to spend all the zillions of dollars. You know, I, I, gotta, I gotta write this check that makes my, you know, my, my throat gag, you know, I got it so, so big, right? Um, and you know, either you're that or you're taking on debt or whatever it is. So what am I paying for? What is the, what's the purpose of this? That's a good conversation to have. Yeah. It's a really healthy, good conversation to have. Don't just go sort of you know, completely unthinking into anything. Why am I doing it? What will I get out of it? I think, uh, I think that's probably a good way to wrap it up. I, I really want to thank you for the chance to talk about all this great stuff. Um, do enjoy the book. And if, you, if you'd like to send me a note about it or whatever, I have some business cards, but it's really easy to remember my email. John at Fulbright.org. Simple. John at Fulbright.org. Um, best of luck to you all. I, I guess there's a, a thing outside. Oh, yes, so if there are refreshments outside, feel free to help yourself. And also, uh, Dr. Reed has agreed to sign him. Yeah, his book yeah. I'll like. sign, sign things and uh, we can chat and, and so on. So again, thank you very much.